Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Amanda Martin and I am the president of the National Education Union. I know for some of you, Tuesday felt like Friday and Friday isn't until tomorrow. It's been an extremely long week and for those of you still on rotors in school as well as um, working at home, planning lessons and making sure that the kids in your care and in your school are being served, I want to just say a massive thank you because on top of that the union have asked you to step up and do a very important role on behalf of your members in your school but also behalf on the pupils and the families and the communities that you live and work in. So thank you very much. Today's call is going to be recorded and the chat will also be recorded. So if you don't want your name to appear in that, then obviously don't comment. This will be available to look at after. Please read the guidance that has been put in the chat on how we conduct um, NEU meetings online. Feel free to chat away in the chat. It is absolutely lovely to see so many hellos of the people flowing through there, um, you know, seeing that you're recognising other people in there as you're saying that. So please feel free to chat in there. The tech team will add various bits of information, maybe clips from the website, um, pinpoint you to key bits of information that we might mention and they're also going to put your regional links in there. So if you haven't um, yet registered for the regional conference which comes after this then you can do so through that chat link and when you enter that chat room you won't be entering it alone there'll be somebody manning it from 4 20 so as soon as you go in you'll be able to get going in there if you want to ask a question please use the q a box the q a icon and in there you need to write uh, what question it is you're asking what your name is and where you are from. Please try not to post them all in there straight away now because some of your questions might well be answered by Kevin and Mary um, in their introduction to you. So it leaves me with no further ado to welcome our Joint General Secretaries, um, Kevin and Mary, who are going to give us a national picture of what's ahead and the various things that have been going on with the NEU. Welcome you two, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. I'm going first this time, Mary and I take it turn and turn about. I just want to say, uh, before the words I've got written in front of me here, that at the moment I feel prouder of being in the union that I'm in now than I've ever felt, and I've always felt really proud of being in the NUT when I was in that, but I think the work that we have done together, our workplace reps, the staff in the union, I'm really proud of working with Mary on all these questions. I think what we've done has been really important. I think we've kept people alive who would have died if we hadn't done the work that we've been doing, and there's a lot more to do. It's a highly anxious time for our members, and it's a highly anxious time for many parents and carers of children. Boris Johnson's announcement on Sunday has created chaos, confusion, and fear. We had no knowledge as the trades union and neither did NAHT or ASCL, the heads unions, we had no idea that Boris Johnson was going to announce the opening of three year groups on Sunday night. We, our, ante our anticipation was one year group. We hadn't been told that, but completely out of the blue. We had no knowledge that a couple of days later he was gonna say nursery schools. We had no knowledge that they were gonna say 15 as a class size, which doesn't permit social distancing. So it caused chaos and confusion. We did a survey immediately after that announcement. The response was truly astounding. Within two hours, 65,000 members had responded. By the time we closed the survey, I think on early on Tuesday morning, 100,000 members had responded to that survey. And that survey showed that the feelings that you have, the feelings that we have, are common throughout our membership. Only 8% of the members would say they were in support of what Boris Johnson had announced. We welcome everyone in the union, so we're glad there are people in the union who support it, but it's only 8% of, of those of our members supported what Boris Johnson said. 96% said they agreed with us that the five tests should be met. You know, a huge percentage of, of our members who've got children themselves say that currently they do not feel reassured by the government that they would not feel safe to send their own children to school at the moment. So. We think we're in the right place. Throughout the whole of this crisis, the NEU has been extremely vis visible. And we know that we know from that survey, but we also know from the fact that since Sunday night at midnight, 7,500 people have joined our union. We know that we're in the right space on this. But we're not doing any of this 
in order to recruit members. What we're doing is about trying to make sure that schools open safely when they open. And so we want to talk through, Mary and I, the steps that we're taking that we think are, are vital for the next steps. We put out an email on Monday night <clears throat> and we advised members in that email not to attend meetings that were planning a 1st of June return. That was a, a holding email in one sense. There was no government guidance. There'd been no chance to talk about it. But it was also an email with a purpose. The government has not engaged with us nationally. They haven't brought about things which keep us safe. They haven't engaged with the trades unions. So we're saying don't talk at school level to try and force conversations at national level. The action of saying don't talk can be misinterpreted. It is not in any way intended to be an action against the head teacher, the vast majority of whom support us and support the stand we're taking. There are always some heads who are trying to rush and who want to open faster than they sh possibly should, and it was an action against them, but it's not an action against the vast majority of heads. We want to work with them in putting pressure upward on the government to talk to us, to talk to the unions, to make sure there's guidance and a safe time to open. And um, thank you, Kevin. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate what Kevin said, immensely proud to be the National Education Union. I do think we're leading the way in this crisis. I do think we're saying what needs to be said and sometimes not, not easy. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that's not easy for us, but also how that won't be easy for you sometimes in the next few weeks as well. And what the union is doing to try and support you as you fulfill your immensely important uh, responsible roles as reps in schools and colleges. So we do want to take you into our thinking and we want to explain our public position and we want to give you some insight into what's happening behind the scenes. And we know that you will treat that information uh, carefully and uh, make good judgments about when we're telling you things which are confidential. Um, so in all our public statements, we have said that we want the National Education Union wants schools to move to a wider opening as soon as it is safe to do so. And that's a really important thing to say, both nationally and locally. We're not just wanting to keep schools closed because we don't like schools, and we don't like education. We want to keep schools not opening on the 1st of June because as the, it stands at the moment, we have not had the answers from the government about the science, which shows us that it will be safe to open schools on the 1st of June. We think the timetable is reckless. Uh, we think it's simply not safe. It's not fair on uh, members who would be going into an unsafe working condition and it's not feasible. And we believe that the government is seeking to shift the responsibility for safety in this pandemic into schools and into community health. And uh, we think that that is untenable. Um, and we also think that shifting the responsibility for the safe opening of schools onto individual head teachers is not fair, it's not reasonable, it's not feasible. It puts them under huge pressure. And we're really knowing that our leadership members are under huge pressure and we're going to be providing them with more help as well. Um, the DfE advice, the Department for Education advice, published on Monday evening, late on Monday evening, is frankly insulting. It's patchy, it's rushed, it's woefully inadequate to support community health and to support safety in schools. And the planning that school leaders are required to do is impossible. A cursory look at the draft government guidance, I have to read this bit. Uh, for, so a cursory look at the draft, draft gov, the, the government toolkit for schools to reopening, tell school leaders to check the building, do a health and safety check, make clear expectations about school cleaning and hygiene, include, including all frequently touched services, which need to be cleaned thoroughly every day. Ensure sufficient hand sanitizers, hot water and soap. Ensure enough disposable tissues. Ensure lidded bins in every classroom. Ensure resources that are cleanable and wipeable. Audit staff to see who can return. Ensure that you have a trained first aider and a safeguarding officer in every school. Create temporary teaching groups, split classes, create teaching spaces, source new teaching staff if you don't have enough. Arrange staggered start and end times, arrange staggered play times and lunch times. If you don't, uh, consider how school meals will be prepared safely. 
Ensure that staff don't come together uh, physically. Communicate with and reassure parents. And plan teaching and learning, all now in 12 days. Uh, and um, of those 12 days, 12 working days, and of those, five of them are half term. We just think this is unreasonable. So what we have done is we've asked for the evidence to support the decision to select particular year groups, reception in year one and year six, going back to school. Particularly because reception and year one are the year groups who are going to find it impossible to understand the concept of social distancing. So the idea that you can have in small classrooms, which we have in England, 15 four and five year olds, not socially distancing, requiring intimate personal care, requiring, uh, you know, uh, guiding, uh, they, get, they have accidents, they cry, they wipe their snot on your trousers. And the idea that you can, with 15 of those four and five year olds, socially distance yourself or socially distance them is just ridiculous. It won't happen. So why has the government chosen these year groups and why have they chosen to go back with the ages of children who are least likely to be able to manage to socially distance? We know that as school leaders, we've, they've been inundated with questions and queries from staff and parents. And the government has stoked enormous anxiety and fear amongst teachers, support staff, leaders of Brighton too, and also real questions from parents, which school leaders simply at the moment can't answer. So there are good reasons for the union taking the stance it is taking. It's not easy. They're getting a battering in the right wing press. Uh, I was on Radio 4 Today programme this morning having a row with David Blunkett. It's not easy to maintain this position, but we think it's the right position for the reasons that Kevin and I have outlined. Well, our position is that there should be national and then local, local authority level planning towards a safe reopening, a wider, a wider opening of schools than currently. But that should be planning towards a condition of when it's safe, not towards a date that is arbitrary and sucked out of the air. The Prime Minister says there is some sort of condition to, to be applied before whether they say June the 1st is the right date. But at the moment, we're completely unclear what that condition is. The planning in Scotland and Ireland and Wales is not towards dates. It's towards when are we going to have the case count low enough? When will we have test hack trace isolate in place, not towards dates. The press sometimes asks us about Denmark. Schools are open in Denmark. We're just about to put some uh, stuff out on social media, looking at some of the differences between here and Denmark. When you look at the number of deaths per million, these are horrible things to be talking about, but it is so much higher in our country than in Denmark. And that makes a real difference to whether it's safe to open or not. Now, the government has not so far answered our questions about what the rate of transmission is amongst children. Now, partly that's because the science is hard to find, but the science we're saying, say, we are seeing, says that children do transmit the disease. If in time the science says that's not true, that would be a good thing. It would make it was easy, mean it was easier to open schools. But there's loads of science at the moment saying children do transmit the disease. Mainly, they don't suffer it as badly as adults, although we have this 100 cases at the moment of Kawasaki syndrome in our country, 100 cases in New York City. So it's not true that there are no children who suffer it badly, but by and large, they seem to suffer it less than adults, but they do transmit it. They haven't answered our questions about that. They haven't answered our questions about what modeling they have about the effect of school op wider opening on the transmission rate in our society and whether test tap trace would then be able to cope. We want that information from them. We want them to withdraw their first sketch for schools, the, th the thing that they put out at the moment, which uh, they admitted in a, in a, in a Commons uh, committee yesterday was a first draft that Public Health England hadn't even signed off on. That needs to be reworked. We want, we're pressing them that on a national level. We've polled parents recently and only 28% of parents support opening schools in the next few weeks. 
On Monday, we sent out emails to reps, to members without a rep and to branch offices saying that we think schools should not be reopening on this timescale and we shouldn't be planning to reopen on this timescale. More than a thousand of those letters have been sent. More than half of our reps have downloaded that letter. We wrote to our leadership members on Monday advising that we think we're not in a position to start planning for a specific date and that they should that leaders should await further union advice we have been working since then because we didn't know what was coming on sunday night we've been working since then with the other tuc unions and we now have a joint tuc statement which i think some of you will have seen yesterday we're going to carry on working with them and we need that work that joint work to develop as much as possible the TUC joint statement says, we all want schools to reopen, but that should only happen when it's safe to do so. The government is showing a lack of understanding about the danger of the spread of coronavirus within schools and outward from schools to parents, siblings and relatives and to the wider community. We think that last section is really important. There will be many children living with grandparents who will be extremely vulnerable if this disease goes home to them and we are concerned for them as much as for our members working in schools. We go on to say in this statement, that's a statement actually that Mary drafted the TUC, you know, some amendments, but it's come from us originally. Uniquely, it appears, school staff will not be protected by social distancing rules. We think this really matters. There's social distancing rules for everybody else, but they're not applying to us, why not? 15 children in a class, combined with their very young age, means that classrooms of four and five-year-olds could become sources of COVID-19 transmission and spread. We know that it might be mild, but we also know, we believe we know, that it can transmit it to adults. And the government doesn't, isn't saying they don't transmit it to adults, which is really important. We think there are risks in that, and the government needs to come clean about what those risks are. They need to publish science on it that other scientists can then comment on instead of just saying behind the scenes, we think the science is okay. That isn't good enough. This statement goes on to say, we call on the government to step back from the 1st of June and to work with us to create the conditions for a safe return based on the principles and the tests rather than a date. That statement signed by us, the NASUWT, NAHT, GMB and Unison. So the, the major unions working in education it's a common statement, It'd be useful for us. Thanks, Kevin. So um, yesterday, uh, we really know that we're right because yesterday uh, there was a remarkable evidence session. It was in front of the Commons um, Science and Technology Committee and um, they called the um, Chief Scientific Advisor and Director of Analysis from the DfE to give evidence. And it was really remarkably, woefully bad. It was remarkably bad, actually. And it absolutely validates our stance. So the Chief Scientific Advisor to the DfE, uh, Osama Rahman, he said that he had not read the DfE guidance on reopening schools. He had not made an assessment of whether or not it could be implemented. Then he said, it was only a draft. Actually, we know that's not true. It's been sent out, it's not a draft, but he was trying to get out of jail free. So then he said it was only a draft. Then he said it would be checked by Public Health England. It won't. Uh, and then, and, and this is all with yesterday, with 13 working days before schools had to, you know, on the 1st of June reopening. Then he said the reopening on June the 1st was dependent on a bunch of conditions being met. As Kevin says, we want to know what those conditions are. Surely that's reasonable. Surely it is reasonable for those who have to work in schools, who want to work in schools, surely it's reasonable to know what are the conditions the government wants to put forward to assure themselves that it is safe and right to go back. And Kevin asked this directly to Gavin Williamson, the Secretary of State for Education on, Wednesday, on Tuesday, and he was really unable to reply. But we want to know what is re, you know what are the reasonable conditions what are the what are the conditions the government wants met before we go back but here's the crucial bit so the chief scientific advisor to the dfe said in answer to the question of infection and transmittability of the disease he said 
There is no evidence to say that children transmit the virus any more than adults. There are some studies which suggest that they might transmit less than adults, but this evidence is mixed. It's quite early, and so there's a low degree of confidence amongst SAGE with the evidence they, that's the children, might transmit it less. In other words, the government has a low degree of confidence in the crucial, the, surely the crucial question, do children transmit the virus as much as, or to a proportion of, adults transmitting the virus? The adult transmission is one adult transmits to every three people, who's, who, uh, someone with COVID, an adult, it's a one to three transmission rate when it's unchecked. So we need to know, this is an absolutely crucial question. And when the chief scientific advisor said, in effect, that we, do, we don't have good evidence on whether children transmit or not, uh, a Scottish MP said, well, does that mean what we're doing is potentially putting together hundreds of potential vectors that can then go and transmit? And his answer was, possibly. Depends on the size of the school. Now, we think that is an astonishing admission. The government does not know whether children can transmit COVID-19, but is opening schools with reception and year one who will find social distancing an alien concept and then up to 15 in the class. And as Kevin said before, this is happening in England only. Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland have made no announcement on reopening. And Kevin and I have a letter from John Swinney, who's the Deputy Minister, Deputy First Minister in Scotland and the Education Secretary. And he said, uh, we sent him the evidence uh, we gave him, we, the body of evidence that we've developed about what do we know about COVID and its transmittability. And he wrote back to us yesterday and said that opening is a highly, highly difficult issue and that in schools in Scotland would open when the evidence says it's safe that they will do so. So they've set no date in Scotland or in Wales on schools reopening. The only part of the UK, and they've not done it in Northern Ireland, the only part of the UK, UK where they set a date, which we think is a completely arbitrary date, is England. So our position's clear. We don't think schools should open on the 1st of June. We instead go from the tests the government has to meet its five tests, which it hasn't met yet, and we have our five tests. That the case count needs to be low enough that, that testing, contact tracing and isolation can do the work of social isolation. That there needs to be social distancing in schools, which their plan doesn't allow for. That there needs to be testing available so that we know if coronavirus is spreading in the schools that we're in. That there needs to be a protocol about what happens if a child or, a, or an adult in the school has a case. And there has to be protection for vulnerable staff, vulnerable parents, and those who live with vulnerable people. We need all of those things to be in place. Those would guarantee, we, or be a, a big contribution towards guaranteeing an acceptable amount of safety. We aren't locking. Those, those conditions are reasonable and sensible. And we, that, that's the way we should go. But we know our position is coming under attack from the right wing politicians and from some politicians who should know better. Like Mary says, she was attacked by David Blunkett on the Today programme this morning. Andrew Adonis, you may have seen on Twitter, attacking our position. These people should know better. We also know that reps are going to be told in some cases that these meetings, these planning meetings are going ahead, whether we're there or not. And that is a difficult moment. And we see that there's lots of questions coming up about that. So our purpose of sending the email on Monday was to say, to try and put a break on it. So we didn't, we didn't start getting an avalanche of just, we're now preparing for the 1st of June. And to try and force these conversations at national level about what things should like, and to give us time to do the work with the other unions. It's still our position that we should not be planning for a return on June the 1st. If there is a meeting in your school though, and other unions are going to it, it'd be better if we can get those other unions to pull back so that nobody's going. But if there are lots of staff who are going in your school, then that presents a difficulty. So what we're currently working on is a checklist that we, that we can put out, which will not be a checklist for opening on June the 1st. It will be a checklist for opening when schools are safe 
and it will be an extremely tough checklist. Every element of what's in the government guidance, there are lots of tests in that, and most schools, we think, cannot meet all of them by a long chalk. And then there are our tests as well, and we, will, we want to have one document, that, uh, if we can produce with the other unions, and we've got some progress on that at the moment. So we've, we're working on that checklist now, so that if you are in a position where you can't stop the meeting going ahead, that we've given you a tool to use in that meeting. We would want you to show that checklist to staff in your school if the meeting is going ahead to explain why every point on there has come from the union and the significance of them. We don't want to use that against the head teachers. If the head is trying to go ahead in a madcap way, it will be against them. But if the head is just feeling under some pressure, we want them to see that they can't meet that checklist. We want them to draw a conclusion from the fact that they can't meet that checklist. And that conclusion should be telling their MP, the unions presented me with this checklist, which is drawn from government guidance largely, and we can't get these things done. It includes the fact that even the government says that, for example, people, anybody who needs a flu jab is supposed to stay at home and not go out, not meet anyone outside their household. Anybody with mild asthma is included in that categorization. That makes it very difficult in many schools. We, we're pushing further on that, as you know, that the people who are relatives of people in those categories should also not be in work. But even the government guidance will make it very difficult. So we're preparing that as a, a fallback position. If in your school, the meeting is going to go ahead, we don't want to be absent from those meetings if they are happening. And uh, I think like I say, we're going to get that jointly with the other unions, we hope, uh, by hopefully by tomorrow. Yeah, we are, we are going to try and get that checklist out tomorrow because we do. Uh, I can see in the chat that lots of people are saying, when are we going to get the checklist? So we're going to try and get that checklist out for you tomorrow. It is really extensive. Uh, we're trying to get you to sign off, but if we can't, we'll get it out to you. We may then reissue it with union sign off, but we will get you something tomorrow. Thank you, you too. Um, a couple of things. I just want to um, just make a comment. There's 2,435 and rising on here. Wow. When you are commenting, that is amazing. But when you are commenting in the chat, please be kind, please be polite. Um, um, this, there is the conduct that we put at the beginning and I haven't had to ask that yet, but there have been some people saying some unpleasant things in the chat. So please do think carefully before you post something. It is a very, very stressful time. We absolutely know this. We, we have been working 24 seven on your behalf and you can hear from Mary and Kevin, we have produced quite a lot of the stuff and it would be great to go and put it straight out but it actually is better when it's badged with every union that we can possibly get on it. And then those education unions, that's what we need to be doing. Okay, I've got um, quite a few questions coming in. We will answer as many as we possibly can, but if we do not get to answer them, I apologize now. With that many of you on this call, we're trying to pick ones that are covered by lots of people and we will look at them afterwards and try and get some update on the website as we have done throughout all of our Zoom calls with reps and branch and districts. So the first question comes from Sam in Oldham. How would you suggest supporting SLT members who must, who very much feel stuck between a rock and a hard place at the moment with wanting to engage with the union, but also feel like they need to do their job and engage with the head teacher? Paul Power, in our Zoom meet, union meeting at work today, a member raised the issue of the vulnerability of BAME members with disproportionate deaths. What is the union's response to this? And Tom Barnett in Dorset, we have today, we have told our heads we are not engaging with planning for the 1st of June. However, I have been told these meetings are going ahead as those refusing to engage are in the minority at my school. What do we do then? Do we hold fast and go along? Or do we prepare? And I think you did answer that, Kevin, in your question, so and Mary. So I'm going to add another one in. Joel from Tower Hamlets. My local mutual aid group, which I'm part of, is discussing how to support unions at the moment. What actions would you say mutual aid networks could take to support the NEU? I go first, Mary. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, I think these are fantastic questions, as are all the questions I'm seeing on the, the chat. Uh, I think Sam's from Oldham's question about the role of SLT and the question from Tom about the checklist. They, 
I mean, it, there's similar questions about what we're doing about these meetings. We think that the SLT members are part of the union group, so we want the position to be that the meeting isn't happening. If the meeting is happening, then uh, SLT members, we want them to have our checklist. We want them to be there. We want there to be a union meeting that looks at the checklist. The SLT member is entitled to be part of the union in the way these things are dealt with. And Tom's question sort of talks about this in a, a similar way. He asks if um, the head there is saying that it's only a minority who are refusing to engage. Now, you never can be sure what the truthfulness of those statements are. But obviously, union action depends on having a majority of the members with us. So it's important that we do get back, if, if that's the case, to a majority status. And therefore, talking to all members about this checklist is full of reasonable requirements that have to be in place, absolutely have to be in place. We would say that any reopening, not a June the 1st reopening, they have to be in place when, the, when it's right at a national level. But these things will stop a reopening on June the 1st because schools will not be able to meet them. So going through the checklist in that way and making sure members understand them, we think is really important. And can I, I um, I've answered all the questions, which is bad because, uh, but Mary can answer the next one. Uh, I've just got into the swing of it. The, the question of black members or uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean members, Asian members, Turkish members, there are, there is developing evidence that people of different ethnicities are affected differently to this. It's not clear how much of that is socioeconomic and how much of it, you know, without having any sort of racist explanation, there are some gene frequencies that are different in different populations. So diabetes can be higher in some populations than others, but there is developing evidence on that. We have asked the government to come clean on what that evidence is, because if that means that somebody who is a black person who is 60 is vastly more at risk than somebody who is a 25 year old healthy person, then that should be taken into account. So we're pressing the government for that and we will come back on that question. We, we have a meeting with government scientists tomorrow. We're not happy about having a meeting uh, that in that format, but we're pressing them there and we want stuff in writing from them that other scientists can interrogate. Thank you. Okay, the next three. The first one, this next one is an anonymous attendee. Can I ask if members should attend training if their school is organising it? The training is supposed to prepare us for the opening of schools and covers health and safety. Deborah Slot, my SLT have been broadly supportive and have listened to members, but I know from experience that our head teacher will follow what other schools in our cluster do. There is, there are, there are no respin the other schools so they're fearing the other schools and they'll follow suit and not, and not resist a plan to move. What can she do? Alex in Surrey, I represent a special needs school and we are fully open because our students have EHCPs despite no social distancing, limited or no PPE and huge risk to both students and staff safety. Is there any further support for SEN schools? And I'll bring you one more in. Graham Copsey, what pressure is being put on local authorities? In Liverpool, Mayor, the Liverpool Mayor has stated he will resist opening of schools on the 1st of June. Can we not get more local authority leaders to do the same? I would say if you've got your local authorities doing that, send it in to us and we will circulate that to other local authorities. Mary, I'll bring you in. Yeah, thanks Amanda. So I'll answer the local authority one first. Brighton have made a very similar statement to Liverpool, but also the Local Government Association, which is the umbrella body for local authorities, put out a really, really good statement today. Now, obviously, they can't politically say it's, it's a conservative control, the Local Government Association. They can't say we're not opening schools on June the 1st. They, that's, they're not in a, a body to do that. But what they have said is that um, parents are very worried and that... Um, school staff are very worried and that the government must give confidence by publishing its scientific evidence on schools reopening on on, on the basis on which schools uh, will reopen and uh, that's really really important because it's it's yet more pressure on the government and also today Leila Moran she just I've just seen it now on uh, email Leila Moran who's the education spokesperson for the Lib Dems has said the same thing uh, that, you know, if we're going to have confidence that it's safe to go back to school, 
then uh, the government must publish its evidence. And, and you know, it was quite interesting in the uh, document that the government put out, that the DfE put out on Monday, uh, when it said the scientific basis on schools returning, it said that well, we've got high confidence that children can get COVID, but they don't get it badly. But there was nothing in that statement that about whether children transmitted to other children or to adults. And, um, and it was immediately evident to us that, that, that there was no mention of that because they didn't have the confidence, which is something that their scientific advisor let slip yesterday. They've got low confidence about the rate of transmission. They don't know. So um, this, this, this um, Leila Moran's e uh, uh, um, message today is really helpful. Show us the evidence. And, you know, I was talking to the government's, um, the, the head of policy, this is private. I was talking to the head of policy at the DfE last night and um, he said, well, we're going to publish our evidence today and they haven't done so yet. And I think there's a problem there. So the evidence is something that we're really, really going to press on because that's important. Uh, with special needs, um, it is very shocking that there is no social distancing going on. That is really, I mean, it's very difficult in a special school. And we do know that special schools have had particular problems because virtually every child there will have an EHCP. And so um, they've all been going to school. And we do know uh, one of the things we've really been pressing for is to have proper personal and protective equipment for staff in special schools. If that's not happening and you're the rep, you have every right to raise that with your school management. And if they're not supportive, to raise it, to get support from local officers to help you raise those issues with your school management and get them addressed. Uh, you, have, you should have the confidence that you have every right to do that. And the checklist tomorrow may be very helpful. I think the government has put out some guidance for special schools. I'm not sure. I think, no, they haven't. They haven't put it out for special schools. But that's, again, something that we will press them on. Um, uh, and the, as, as Kevin said in the last answer, um, uh, uh, if, if the SLT is broadly supportive, but are going to be under pressure, then they are part of the union. And, you know, they need to hear the message that we're not doing this to be obstructive. We're doing this because we have real concerns. Again, the checklist will help. At going for a health and safety training meeting, uh, one of the things that the government has said in the guidance is that um, adults in school should not congregate together. That is actually in the guidance. So what, what it says is that uh, adults should be with children. They should be with the same children in the same groups. They shouldn't be rotors. So you should be with the same 15 children every time they come into school. And they should not congregate together. So you shouldn't be going in for a health and safety meeting if he's going to expect you or that she to congregate together. It, um, you know, that's not that's that's against the government guidance. And um, uh, you'll see that in our checklist. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I've got some more questions. Um, Kate Maxwell. And this is one because when we talked about reception in year one, there was also nursery has, it wasn't announced on Sunday, but it was in the paperwork to say nursery are returning. So we are worried about the impact of social distancing measures on children's emotional well-being and mental health, especially for the youngest nursery year or, and year one. For example, what is the NEU's position on how teachers and support staff can reasonably provide emotional to support so young children will be ex experiencing separation anxiety without any physical contact? Um, that's Kate. Susan Jackson, what would the NEU's view be of very small schools, which may be for logistical reasons, decide to open more wildly, wi widely than the current list of year groups with small cohorts from one to seven children? Because she fears this will be suggested in smaller rural schools. And Martin Powell Davis from Lanarkshire says, staff need confidence that they have right to refuse to go into unsafe workplaces where heads are pushing, being pushed to open despite dangers. Is the union going to say more firmly to build on their original press release? Kevin, I'll start um, with you. Or Mary, I'll start with you. No, 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 Kevin should do them. But Jane, is, who is our legal expert and health and safety advisor, can absolutely give the line. So she may want to come in about the health and safety legislation. So I'll say something about the, uh, the emotional contact and the younger children and then something about the famous section 44 and Jane can uh, correct me about that if I go wrong on it or say something anyway. So this question of uh, 
the fact that children at that age are not going to be able to socially distance is just so obvious, it shouldn't need stating. But if children are transmitters, then there is a real question of why they aren't socially distancing. So us pressing on the evidence for that really matters. The fact that they've announced this nursery, which they, we didn't know that, that we didn't know year one, year R and year six were coming, but the fact that they added nursery in, I think tells you everything about their lack of knowledge of what our schools are. So if you think about the position of an infant school, which only has a nursery, a reception, year one and year two, and all and three of those four years are in, and then they're supposed to be split into two groups of 15, which requires six classrooms in a four classroom school. It makes no sense. They haven't thought those things through at all. And in that situation, if, if we're in those rooms with 15 children, that we will have to comfort them. That is gonna have to happen. You, you can't avoid it. And there'll be no social distancing whatsoever. Now, it may be possible if the government were more sensible on a different time scale to do something that would allow you some measure. So in Denmark, we're seeing, so first of all, the case count in Denmark is far, far lower than it is here. The death rate is far lower. The case count is far lower. So it's safer to, it, that means there's less virus around, which means it's a, that bit safer. But even there, they're teaching in groups of 10, not 15. Their classrooms are generally bigger than ours. So there's more room for those 10. And even within those 10, they're telling that they're having those kids in groups of five within the 10. Now, you, don't, you haven't got perfect social distancing in that situation, but you have cut the number of contacts dramatically. And that's something that we could be looking at if our government was not rushing ahead in this madcap, reckless way that if they were talking more like other governments are talking, then there's something to do. And then maybe you could get some way towards it. The, the question from uh, Martin Powell Davis about the right to refuse to work in unsafe, uh, it's an implied part of your contract, of every contract. Contracts exist between workers and bosses. Some of the terms are explicit and some of them are called implied terms. And it's an implied term of everybody's contract that you do not have to work somewhere that's unsafe. That's not a surprise really, is it? You can't be compelled to work somewhere that's unsafe. There are some tests that apply to that. There has to be a, a real danger, but the words they use around those tests, and I'll let Jane put those words in, the words they use around those tests are the very same words they used in the Coronavirus Act to say why they were bringing it in. So the danger that they expressed about the coronavirus is the same words that are in the legislation about the sorts of things you can protect yourself against. So there's an implied term there. Section 44 of the Employment Act 1996, if I got that right, gives you some protection if the employer tried to move against you when you refuse to work in an unsafe place. And the union is there to protect you as well. We will have more and more guidance on that, but that's, we, we want to be absolutely clear and we'll come back to you before we, before we go further with that. And I, maybe Jane should add in some detail around that or just restate it even. Jane. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, I thought you did very well there. Um, but despite not being a lawyer, you've got a second career or third career in the, in the offing. Um, so basically, um, what Section 44 says is you will be protected as an employee if your employer takes action against you because you don't attend your workplace because of a uh, risk of serious and imminent danger. Um, as Kevin says, the actual right not to attend the workplace in the first place comes from your contract of employment. Everybody can make a decision. You know, if you were walking up to your school and it was on fire, you would quite reasonably decide not to go into that workplace. And this is just the same. It's the same risk to an individual's health and safety and the health and safety of others. So it's your contract that says you don't have to attend work if, it's, if there's a, a risk, uh, a serious and imminent risk of danger. Again, as Kevin said, the coronavirus regulations described uh, the virus as a serious and imminent risk to public health. So they're using exactly the same words that 
exist in the Employment Rights Act. What we all need to be alive to is that Section 44 should act as a deterrent to employers so that if somebody says, I'm not going into the workplace, there is a serious and imminent risk of danger, the employer doesn't take any action against that individual. But we all know that there are employers who will do something stupid and decide to take action and possibly dismiss a member of staff because they've taken that decision. So the NEU will be there to support anybody who is placed in that position. What we hope is that people aren't making that decision alone, that, that, that the school as a community decide that there is a risk to public health and everybody has that discussion together. But you as reps may well be placed in quite difficult positions when we are finally at a place where we're looking at the wider opening of schools. We'll be doing lots to support you in that situation. The checklist thing that we're talking about for this immediate place, that can be there. And if, if, if there are boxes not ticked on that checklist, we will say that implies that our belief that the site, the site is unsafe. We'll be wanting that to be common with the other unions. So it'll be a joint union position. We think most employers wouldn't go near challenging somebody if they are breaking health and safety law in this situation. So we'll be using, uh, using the checklist in that sort of way. We would then be elaborating with you an escalation procedure that an individual member talks to the rep, that the rep talks to their branch secretary. If the, the rep talks to the head and says, you're going wrong here, you shouldn't ask that vulnerable person to come in, for example, the rep goes to the branch secretary, the branch secretary talks to the head and says, what are you doing? You're making this dangerous. We're going to be in real trouble here. If that doesn't work, that we get the branch, the, the, the regional, the branch secretary goes to the regional secretary before we reach the point of refusal to go in. So we'll do that quickly and we'll be talking with our regional secretaries about putting things on social media, saying this school is putting lives at risk. And we'll be threatening heads with that if they're doing that sort of, uh, if they're behaving in those bad ways, we'll be doing all of that before we reach an escalation of having to refuse to work we'll try and back the head away from it in the first place of asking you to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Mary. And thank you, Jane. Great insight. Um, Pat Penny Appleyard. Uh, I have heard that Gavin Williamson mentioned schools could be open over summer. Following this, some head teachers, not her school, have already approached staff asking if they would volunteer to come in during this time. What advice can you give to those members of staff? And Charlotte McFarlane, I'm a rep at a school that is part of a large well-known mat. We have not been asked to attend meetings about returning or surveyed or anything. So we haven't really had the chance to disengage. But we know that they are clearly planning is going on at the mat and federation level and has a letter gone out, and a letter has gone out to parents saying school will be open. What can we do in this case as union members? And that's Charlotte in South London. And the final one, Claire Andrews in Great Yarmouth. Our head is refusing to open to nursery and year our children and is proposing to open in some form to year six only in groups of 10 with extensive risk assessment, strict two metre social distancing and protection for vulnerable staff. Comments on this, please. Okay, so um, thanks, Amanda. So schools opening over the summer. Gavin Williamson has, has confirmed to us uh, that schools will not be opening over the summer. So uh, colleagues should not be being asked about that. That will not be happening. It may be that some schools say they want to run clubs. Uh, well, then, if they, uh, they're going to do that or do, uh, do something like, like that, then um, that should be on a voluntary basis. There should be no compulsion about it, and actually people should be paid. But there is no compulsion to work over the summer, and the Secretary of State has said that. It's one of the few things he has said, and he has said clearly that we agree with. Um, the Charlotte in the map with the letter going out to parents said it'll be opening. We would, I would advise you to send our letter. Send the letter that we sent out on um, um, Monday evening. You might want to amend it a bit if you think it's, uh, you know that you want to be a bit more conciliatory, uh, but you might not. Send the letter and say we are not engaging with going with planning about going to back on back on June the first. That letter demands a response. So do send that letter and do insert yourself. If you think the planning is going on without you, then insert yourself into it and get our checklist into that. And Claire, 
if your head teacher is making very sensible decisions not to put in reception and year one and to only go back with year six and rigid social distancing then that may be by June the 1st a position where you know that is one of the better positions because other schools will be doing something much more dangerous so we would ask you to engage properly with your head about that and engage with her about what her social distancing rules uh, really look like but frankly we want more heads to be making very very sensible decisions like that as well it sounds as though within the constraints of what's been asked she's really trying to do her best and try and support her with that we don't think year 60 should be back either but certainly not having reception in year one in she's doing a lot more than many heads will be planning on at the moment kevin did you want to add anything on those just that uh, when the time is right nationally to reopen, when the government has met its tests and passed our tests, then the model of going year six with groups of 10 would be a sensible way to approach it mm. instead of trying to bring in and then see if you can make social distancing work in those circumstances before you go to a, a wider opening. Uh, if, if, the, if Boris Johnson had said on Sunday, we want to reopen for, uh, on the 1st of June and we're going to try and get more vulnerable children into school because we know that vulnerable children need education or we're going to try with uh, year six, then, um, you know, we would have had a, probably a different reaction. It was just the weight of getting three year groups in um, in a, such a short period of time with the virus at its current level and with the rate of transmission at its current level. So, you know, that was what we, you know, that was what, and giving us no indication, no, no prior notice that this is what's going to happen. We just think it's unreasonable and unworkable. And as a, as a reception teacher last year, the ages of the children as well were very much unreasonable. Um, I've got a question from Claire Nicholson. And firstly, I'm going to say thank you, Claire. We believe you are in absolutely the right union. You're our head teacher and you're in the you're an NEU member. Your planning has been around the safe return for a very limited number based on experience of our, of our being open throughout for a small group of children on emergency access. Can you acknowledge that this is very difficult for NEU heads working in areas of high social need? I'm also checking with health agencies with regards to staff who have mild asthma and I'm receiving very conflicting advice. The situation is impossible for everyone trying to behave in a way which keeps staff and children safe. I'll leave you both with that because I've got one more which I think you've answered. Have the government made it clear why they've chosen the year groups they have to return to school on the 1st of June? And the answer is no, they absolutely haven't. So I'll leave you with that one and then I'll talk about where people need to go after. Head teacher one, Kevin or Mary, who's going to reply? Uh, well, first of all, Amanda, you're absolutely right that uh, we're really proud to be the second biggest head teacher union in the country. Our head teacher um, council has does fantastic work. Our school leadership council does fantastic work for us, and we acknowledge the pressure on those leadership colleagues is immense at the moment. And so, and there are, I mean, I've seen a question that we haven't we haven't been asked. It's in, been in the chat, but there are schools that are almost entirely open at the moment. There are some SEN settings where where our colleagues are working and head teachers are coping in that circumstance and so the idea of planning what you would do when the time was right is something that we think is a good idea we're saying the time isn't right the government hasn't met its tests hasn't met its own tests and hasn't met our tests but the idea that you look for how you would do it what the what the way of ramping it up is slowly there are ways that would can be withdrawn from as well if the r number goes the, the wrong way those are things that are worth thinking about locally and feeding into the national union Thank you. Mary, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, only to say thank you for, any, for all of you coming in on, because we're just nearly running out of time. So before I go, I'd just like to say it's really hard at the moment, but it's really right. We're in the right place. We're doing the right thing. Uh, I know that some of you are going to have to have difficult conversations with your school leaders. Uh, you might have to have quite challenging conversation with colleagues, uh, but you are doing the right thing. You are keeping yourselves safe. You're keeping your colleagues safe and you're keeping your children safe. So thank you for being NEU reps and thank you for the work that you're doing.
I agree. And I want to echo that, that thank you. And there are some things that we always ask you to do um, at the end of this. One of them actions for this evening is to send a letter to your leadership team. Now we've heard from Mary and Kevin and questions that have come through from you. You need to gauge the relationship you have with your head teacher in how you write that letter. This is not an attack on them. It is an attack on the government. We need to know it is safe to return to school. As Kevin and Mary have repeated, the government haven't met their own tests, let alone ours. And the evidence is still conflicting that's coming out. Have a look back if you can on yesterday's, on Twitter, just on that chief scientist, and you will see the quotes that he said. We are not making this up. It is. It sounds like it because it's farcical, but it isn't. It is very, very serious. So please send a letter to your leadership. Organize a members meeting to discuss the national approach. Take from what we've said today, really think carefully and how you word those and think about the conversations you're going to have. Set up a WhatsApp group and there is guidance on the link that has come through on the email. I'm really sorry that we didn't get to do all of the questions. We had over 450. They've been posted and we will work through them and look at them. And they, they always form part of our guidance um, as, as we go through. What you need to do now is to go to your regional meetings where there will be more information on the practical things you can do and more support and you'll be able to um, hear from people in your region and work with reps that are in your region as well. It only leaves me to say a huge thank you very much. This is no way near the end of the road but we have made such waves. We have, as we said, recruited seven, seven and a half thousand new members since that Sunday night. We are doing the right thing and sometimes it's difficult to say the right thing and to stand up and be counted. But it isn't just for you. You are doing this for your members, your kids. I'm a teacher and I wouldn't want my kids to be going into a place that is dangerous for them and then going home to their families. So you have our support. Please continue to work hard, but also take a break and try and recruit another rep to help you, whether it's a health and safety or whether it's just a colleague in the school to help you. Try and work with other unions. We've got the joint signatory and that's a great way to go along. And that includes the NHT. So thank you very much for your time. You are the union. And I always say you join a union and if a family is the union you choose to join and you are absolutely in the best family. Thank you very much.